Hello, hello. Oh, okay, great. Hello, everybody. And um, thank you for choosing to spend your Thursday evening with us, your first Thursday of the year. I'm not quite sure when the year started. But welcome to the People's Forum. If you haven't been here before, we are a political education center, community center, cultural center. Um, we wear a ton of different hats. We host uh, grassroots organizations and nonprofits for their events, their meetings. Um, but we also have our own programming. Um, actually, next week, we're starting a revolutionary feminism course. Um, and then we also have um, a video series with David Harvey on and Risa. So if you're interested in that, you can tune in on our YouTube. Um, but we also have like concerts. We've had a punk rock concert here once or twice, um, fashion shows, all that kind of stuff. There's even an art exhibit around you on Haiti and calling for no intervention in Haiti. So if you're interested in what we have to offer, whether you're in New York or if you're out of town, a lot of our offerings are hybrid. So check us out on social media, our newsletter, all that stuff. Okay, that was my first intro of the year. <laughs> I feel like I'm dusting off some dust. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I can't think of a better way to start off the year than with tonight's book talk. Um, I think you know, as we look to the as we look to towards 2023 and thinking about how we can build on our organizations and our struggles, um, no better way to look at people who have been doing it for a long, long time. <laughs> Um, so I am excited to introduce today's book talk, um, Dancing with History, A Life for Peace and Justice by George Lakey. Um, we're going to be hearing from him about a lifetime of struggle um, from the civil rights movement to calling for peace in Vietnam um, to um, even today, climate justice. I know you got arrested, uh, I guess not last year, but the year before now. <laughs> and so you can see he's still very active in his work. And so I think for myself as a young organizer, I'm really excited to hear how we can sustain our work, how we can still derive joy from it, and you know, work towards building a world that we want to live in and we want to thrive in. Um, I am realizing, unfortunately, I forgot my bios of these lovely people next to me elsewhere. Um, but I'll put them in the link below. And I want to just you know, note how accomplished they both are. Um, so of course, we're joined by author George Lakey and Yoda Marum. Apologies, you guys. <laughs> Other than that, um, enjoy the conversation. Thanks so much. OK. Um, thanks for coming. It's a very sweet group. I feel like I know a lot of you. Um, so this will be a little bit like custom made for you. Can you hear me? Is this okay? All right. Um, I'm Yotam. I'm a facilitator, organizer, et cetera. And um, part of the reason that I think I'm uh, facilitating, moderating, interviewing, uh, is because George is one of my, George is my closest mentor. And I think I, I know I would not be the facilitator that I am without George. I also, I also don't think I would be the same person I am, the same parent I am, the same kind of revolutionary that I am without George. So it's an honor. Thank you. Um, George. Uh, George has done, I mean, the first thing I'm struck by in this book is George has done a lot of shit. George has done a lot of shit. Um, so uh, this sort of like brief sketch of that or a few little tidbits, we're talking, just so you understand a little bit about like who we're dealing with here. Uh, George is 85. So he grew up, I don't know, 100 years ago, do the math, and uh, is a, working class boy from Pennsylvania and uh, has spent basically uh, spent time in the civil rights movement, played important roles in the civil rights movement, which we'll talk about here, um, played an important role in the anti-Vietnam War protest. He sailed on a ship to, uh, to bring medicine to Vietnamese civilians and crossed the blockade. He accompanied like human rights attorneys in Sri Lanka to help them not get assassinated. He organized against apartheid, against war, against nuclear armament. He came out as a gay man in a time where that was, in a time and place where that was extremely complicated. He fought for gay rights, um, supported ACT UP, um, 
built a training organization to train other people how to do that, built a climate or justice organization that does direct action even just not long ago. So it's been a lot. Um, and through that, George has taken, well, let's uh, take a step back. How are you doing? <laughs> How are you doing so far? <laughs> I'm hot. I'm going to take off my sweater. <laughs> this is my Norwegian sweater. It's one of my favorite gizmos because it's hard for people to stereotype me uh, because uh, what do you do with somebody who's wearing a Norwegian sweater? But anyway, um, <laughs> I think you say, why are you still wearing a sweater when it's so warm in here? So that's how I'm doing. Cool. Gotcha. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of talking. I'll ask George some questions. I'll ask George to read a little bit from the book so you can get a taste of that. Um, and, and then we'll open it up for, for you to ask questions and talk with George. Um, so the first thing that I want to just, again, I'm sort of on the same line that I was just on about how much George has done. I think one of the things that struck me about the book was how many different roles you've played, not just the places you've been and the things you've done, but the different roles you've played. Um, the roles that I tracked were a sort of creative direct action practitioner, a campaigner to like actually see a campaign from beginning to end and win real things, uh, a trainer, training other people how to do that, a facilitator, sort of like supporting other people to find themselves and their agency, uh, a communalist. George also f helped build a network of communal living homes that practiced also direct action, so like a fusion between direct action and communal living. Um, a parent, mentor, healer. So I, my first question is, what's it been like to sort of move through those various roles in your life? And is there one that you're, you feel like you're inhabiting now more than others? What it's been like, I think, is putting a lot of things aside to be able to focus on one thing as it's right in front of me, or a second thing that I see on the horizon and need to pay a little attention to, but while I'm doing one thing, uh, so I've, I've cultivated, an, I don't know when that happened in my life. I think it was uh, in college days, I actually realized that if I tried to do everything at once, I would be totally overwhelmed and uh, that it would make sense to do one main thing at a time and have another thing kind of in the back burner, you know, getting ready to be, because I can also uh, run out of gas on something. I'm, um, I'm not very good at taking up something and doing it for 20 years. And so I need... Uh, both, I need to innovate whatever in whatever field I'm doing, whether I'm organizing or doing direct action or whatever it is, writing, I want to innovate, um, but that helps keep me fresh. But also, I want to shift to some other contribution to the movement, and that helps keep me fresh. So, uh, so these are all very idiosyncratic, I think. There are other people who are just so happy. I've met people blissful doing the same, you know, playing the same role in the movement for 40 years. And they're just really happy doing that. And it's, it's great because people can count on them to be able to do that and so on. So it's not like my way is the way. It's just that it, it works for me. And, uh, and I'm glad I found out early enough so that I could keep doing it. Although there was the time that I crashed. And, and so I did actually get cancer. And uh, it was supposed to kill me. And so that takes a, a particularly long chapter to tell how it is that my community, uh, my activist community, decided, well, we're not ready to say goodbye to George yet. <laughs> Whether he's ready or not, we, we aren't ready. <laughs> and so they kind of banded together and saw me through the cancer and out the other side, uh, since I seem to be still breathing. Um, and that was half a lifetime ago. So it's not like it's been smooth sailing. Uh, the way I've tried to program myself has not always been smooth. But nevertheless, it's it's worked for me. So I wanna um, I want you to spotlight one of those roles. Well, there, there's a story in the book that I thought kind of like highlighted a few of the roles at once, of a sort of like direct action practitioner and trainer and campaigner. And it's a story from uh, the Freedom Summer story. Yeah. So I'm gonna have George just read you a little piece of that. 
Well, because I was both um, an, an activist on behalf of anti-racist causes in the, in the 60s and also um, was, found myself becoming a trainer because there were so many people coming into the movement at that time and really looking for skills. And it was, of course, a dangerous time to be anti-racist or really it was a dangerous time. <laughs> Almost anything you wanted to do in the 60s because the 60s were so polarized, uh, like now, um, in, in some ways more polarized than things are now. And so um, it was a time when people really wanted the reassurance of going to a workshop and enhancing the chance that they would come out of all this alive. And so I, I developed uh, some skills there and got invited to um, join the summer staff, the, the, the staff, the training staff for Mississippi Summer, also called Mississippi Freedom Summer. Yes. Ah, you, you were in it. You love it. Well, it was so incredibly daring, right? I mean, Mississippi, the hardcore. Mississippi was run by the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council, right? And they all wanted black people dead, uppity black people to be dead, not getting to vote and stuff like that. So the, the, the issue became most clear in Mississippi. And that's where Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee people went and <laughs> decided it's time to take on Mississippi. And what could be better than recruiting a thousand young people from the North to come down here and risk their lives with us? Because that means a thousand white parents, pairs of parents in the North and grandmas and so on, will all be all over the Congress people and so on saying, Protect my daughter, protect my son. They're down there risking their lives. It was a very clever political uh, political strategy. And I was, I was all for it, having already risked my life uh, for the cause. So there we go. In right, June just, 19... Just before you start yeah. reading that, the, yeah, yeah. Part, the excerpt that George is about to read is just after the part in the book where George talks about the direct action training manual. The first, oh, yeah. as far as we know the first direct action training manual that was written for the civil rights movement, which George co-authored, Bayard Rustin wrote the foreword, we worked on it together, and that was what they were being trained on in this thing that George is about to read about. Yeah. Very, very exciting times. In June 1964, I joined the Freedom Summer training staff in Ohio for the first week's batch of nearly 500 volunteers. It was my first chance to work with Reverend James Lawson, who had studied Gandhi's work in India before training the founding leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In Ohio, we relied heavily on role plays, giving participants nonviolent combat training to orient them to conflicts that they might encounter. Actually, if I were writing that again, I would say most certainly will encounter. <laughs> the staff included a number of SNCC workers who were fresh from the field in Mississippi. At the end of the week, I watched the students board the buses headed for the South. So that was the half, the first half of the thousand, right? After a day to debrief and relax, the training staff welcomed another batch of hundreds of volunteers. On the second day of the second week, we were all called to the college auditorium. The students from the first week were already distributed around Mississippi. I found a seat in the second row of the auditorium along with others on the training staff, guessing we would get a progress report. But when a federal official who had been observing the training came to the center of the stage, he appeared upset. He looked around, then stared at the paper he had placed on the rostrum. We've just received word that three of the Freedom Summer workers are missing together in Mississippi, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. Cheney was a SNCC field organizer, Goodman and Schwerner were student volunteers. I was stunned. Cheney, along with other SNCC organizers, had been at high risk for months, I knew. But Goodman and Schwerner had been here in our training the previous week. Volunteers like the students sitting around me. And they might already be dead. Looking around, I wondered what the students were imagining. How many of them would quickly return to the northern suburban homes that many of them had come from? Over the next few days, I watched the SNCC workers take on the role of older siblings to these frightened students. Along with our training, 
that combination built an invincible container, strong enough to hold the shock and grief and fear that rocked our training. Under the old trees of the campus, stories and listening, freedom songs and prayers were shared. Very few students went home. At the end of the training, most got on the buses and took their turn to head toward Mississippi. SNCC's 1964 campaign turned out to be one of the boldest and most brilliant strategic moves of the entire civil rights movement, with lessons for today. Their primary target was the federal government, led by the, federal, by the Democratic administration, which was highly reluctant to support racial integration in the South. SNCC joined Bayard Rustin, Dr. King, and others in believing the federal pressure was needed to force change, and it worked. Thanks, Rick. I kind of have a follow-up question to that, which is, uh, were you scared? Were you scared then? Or can you think of a time that you were scared personally? And how did you deal with, how did you deal with that? Oh, yeah, I wasn't scared because I wasn't going to Mississippi. <laughs> 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 However, <laughs> I was scared every time I got arrested, uh, you know, in, in the, in the, uh, work that I was doing and uh and also times when I wasn't um wasn't arrested like well, there is a story here in the book about uh I was one of the training things that I got going was a summer long training for high schoolers who were brave enough to say we want to learn how to be uh nonviolent uh, you know workers for change and uh we want to be trained to do it and I believed very strongly in the technique the training technique uh, called standing on a box and speaking to whoever's coming by on the street. It scares the bejesus out of everybody that, that I know, uh, including me when I do it. It's just really terrifying. It's a wonderful training technique because so much of training has to do with developing courage. And the best way to develop courage is to get scared and do something that we're going to do anyway. And so, uh, so we had these young people uh, going out on the street and taking turns standing on the box. And in the beginning, the youth worker for this Quaker agency I was working with and I would go first, you know, just to break the ice a little bit. And then they would have their, their moment of truth and uh, somehow survive and get off the box and somebody else would take a turn, right? And uh, so one of those times uh, that I do talk about in the book in relation to your question, you know, Tom, uh, one of those times um, after I, I started the thing off and then I was floating into the middle of the crowd of people that had gathered and uh, was just standing there, you know, appreciating and kind of rooting for the young people who were taking their turn. And uh, I noticed a hard-faced looking guy was sort of edging his way closer and closer to me in this very densely packed crowd. And I thought, oh, well, I tend to be very alert in crowds, I think because I'm an activist. And so I was noticing you know, his working his way over. And I thought, oh, what's this? What's this? What's this? And so I just, while appearing to give full attention to the, to the uh, teenager up there on the box, I was actually watching him. And uh, he came very close and I looked at him and his eyes went down. So I followed his eyes down and his knife was out and it was about that far away from my belly. And I looked back to his eyes and he said, I'm just back from Nam. Fuck you. So I got the picture and I continued to look in his eyes and I said, I know that you can hurt me. Think though, before you do, what the consequences might be for you. And he thought for a minute, put the knife back in his pocket and quickly moved away. So that was one of the times, I've, several times I've had knives pulled on me, actually. And I've been beaten up by a gang and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, you, you know, yeah, you know I mean, it happens, right? <laughs> hey, I'm 85, you know. I mean, by the time you're 85, you'll, you'll have been beaten up several times, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. So the question is, I think, how do yeah. you, in a moment like that, what's, how do you stay in it? Or oh, one way I'm able to stay there is because I've heard a lot of stories. Actually, stories are such a meaningful form of communicate of, of teaching, and I've just always sopped up stories, especially stories that are, are have, have to do with my fears. I think some of the stories that are most meaningful to any of us is the stories that have to do with what we're especially scared of, right? We, we're just really like on when we hear stories like that. And uh, so, and I have a lot of fears. So, uh, you know, I pay attention to sto people's stories that relate to that. And, I, and I've always hung around from when I was a teenager, uh, just getting to, used to the movement, I would hang around older people who chances were had stories that I could benefit from. And so I heard, so many. I, I have other stories in here of getting out of, uh, there was a gang situation. I was in a very, very tight situation. And I got out of it because I remembered a story that Reverend James Lawson had told in a training that I'd been to. And, uh, and I thought, huh, well, he, got, he, he survived as a result of that technique he used. I'll try the same technique. And I worked. I, I did it. And it worked for me, too. Uh, so it's in the book. So that's all at, at no added expense. You can get all these stories out of the book uh, that might save your life or at least, uh, r you know, reduce the number of bruises <laughs> and fracture limbs. <laughs> you heard it here. No added expense. Just the original expense of the book. It looks like a Red Cross <laughs> handbook, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Onwards. I was struck... I've, I've known you for a long time, and I feel like I've gotten to know you in a role in a role that is more, you know, sort of uh, like wise elder mentor teacher type. And I was struck by the vulnerability of this book. And I, I appreciated really getting to see you as a young person struggling with your sexuality, as a parent struggling with your kids as a partner struggling with your what you know just a lot of and i i was just sort of really taken aback by how honest and raw uh frankly a little sexy parts of this book were um and i wanted to ask you yeah what was the how did you what was the process like for you of being vulnerable in this book and what did it do for oh, you? I sweated a lot while I was writing it. You know? <laughs> I did. I sweated a lot. Yeah. Because I, I kept thinking, do I really want? And I thought, write it, George, and then decide. You know? <laughs> and then another, you know, another juicy story would come to me. And, I would, and midway through, I'd say, do I really want? Write it, George, and then decide. So not everything I wrote got into the book. In fact, the publisher of the, the, the uh, senior person in the publishing firm called me after I submitted my first draft, which is twice as big as this. And uh, he, he called me personally and he said, George, your last name is not Obama. We can't publish a book this big and make any money at all unless your last name is Obama. <laughs> <laughs> 115,000 words, period. Oh, so, you know, a couple of those juicy stories did, did, uh, didn't survive. But a lot of them, as you say, did. Um, and part of it is, I thought, well, if, if part of courage, definitely a big deal with me, courage. If, if courage has to do with going ahead and doing something, even when we're sweating, even when it's cold sweat, um, then uh, why... And if I'm willing to do that in action, why shouldn't I be willing to do that in writing? Hmm. And so my other 10 books are mostly about other people, <laughs> way more convenient to write about, right? And this one is, uh, is me, yeah, me facing it. Would you share one of those stories now? Okay. It, which one is that one? Is that the cancer one? Yeah. Okay. The cancer one. Yeah. Whew. I mean, I'm sweating now. After effects of the sweater, probably. Why do people do these things? All right. When my friend Ellen Deacon came to visit me in the hospital, 
She saw immediately the hell I was in. Oh, Ellen, I gasped, my head turning from side to side. I can't tell you what this is like. Well, George, she said with a smile and a relaxed voice, I can see you're getting pretty intimate with pain. Have you been properly introduced yet? Seeing me roll my eyes, she continued, well, after all, if you two are getting that intimate, you should at least be introduced. Even though I was groaning, I could see she was going somewhere with this. Ellen was tall with long, very curly red hair and an air of authority. She was a music educator as well as a member of our Movement for New Society network. I trusted her a lot. I surrendered. Okay, okay, Ellen. I'll conduct the introduction, she explained, and you'll speak both for yourself and for your pain. How about starting by telling pain your name and that you don't usually have pain visiting and how you feel about it? Ellen soon had me voicing a dialogue between me and pain, during which pain told me and found me skeptical that it was actually on my side and wanted to be my friend. By the end of the dialogue, I learned to regard the pain as my companion, sharing with me in the process of healing. And of course, the hurting diminished, since pain is mental as well as physical. I didn't go back to the pain medication after all. When Ellen's dad walked in a couple days later, however, he did not find a man with a positive attitude. I was still very scared of dying. <sighs> that was the expectation of the medical, uh, of the doctors that I would die. Uh, I was still very scared of dying and full of why me complaints, the very essence of victimhood. Earl Deacon saw my de condition and matter-of-factly explained that some years ago he had beaten the cancer that was supposed to do him in. He said when his daughter told him about me, he felt moved to come from Texas and pay me a visit. I got curious and asked him about his experience, and he slowly worked his way around to the punchline. I took responsibility for my illness and asked myself how I had helped to make the cancer grow. My attitude slammed into reverse. No way, I said. To me, the cancer was an alien killer, intruding from outer space, wholly other. I was a helpless victim who had been going about my life seeking to do good. No way could I have any responsibility for this demon in my body. Earl was relaxed and patient with my resistance. When he left, my work started because I couldn't help asking myself, what if I were to take Earl's point of view? Not that it could be objectively true, mind you, but what if I were to hold the attitude that I had some responsibility for the growth of my cancer? It would mean that having been powerful enough to grow it, I'm also powerful enough to shrink it, maybe even to make it disappear. Power interests me. I got interested. Could I adopt an attitude I didn't entirely believe in philosophically? Why not? Had I lived my life with a 100% consistent worldview? <laughs> Does anyone? except perhaps some legendary guru in a Himalayan cave. Now, I felt, was the time to reach for the methods that support life. My Methodist upbringing again. One method might be an inner search that could reveal a part of me that would invite a cancer. It wasn't so strange for me to take responsibility. I do it a lot in my life. This was not about self-blame. Self-responsibility is a very different kind of notion. It's about power, whereas blame is the cultivation of powerlessness. Can you say more about the last part? 
the difference between blame and what is it blame and responsibility i think that's acted out in the streets a lot by activists blame is let's go out and protest in the streets express our point of view down with this whatever very powerless act doesn't do a thing doesn't move anything what moves stuff is campaigns campaigns of one sort or another it could be a legislative campaign my favorite is nonviolent direct action campaigns the kind of thing that dr king and so many other amazing brave people in the south taught us how to do for, especially for white people who are willing to learn from black people <laughs> they really showed us the art and science of doing direct action campaigning that gets results but protests don't so that's a, a, a very clear difference any amount of you know oh let's blame somebody for this let's run out into the street and blame somebody doesn't do a thing it's powerless the act of powerlessness i've done it just to be in solidarity with whoever called the <laughs> whoever blew the trumpet but with no illusion that it was even worth my time of day except in the sense of solidarity campaigns now that i know about <laughs> one of the stories i tell in the book is about a small group that i assembled in my living room <laughs> it was a small group and we decided to go after the seventh largest bank in the country and force it to give up uh, its role of being number one financer of mountaintop removal coal mining. This is going to be our way of doing working on climate justice because it's horrible for the Appalachian people and it's horrible for nature and it's horrible for the climate, right? Blowing up mountains for coal. And PNC Bank was doing that. PNC we have in, in New York here as well. And they were the number one financer of this horrible, horrible practice. So this small group of people said, okay, let's stop them from doing it. <laughs> and we did. So I, I tell that story in, in here. And uh, some of the people who started the Sunrise Movement got their start in direct action by participating in that campaign. It was it was a glorious campaign. It took us five years because if you start with a group that's the size that size, it takes you a while to work up to the thirteen state uh, coalition that we were able to develop. But by the time we'd reached thirteen states, um, this uh, enormous bank looked at us and said, "There's no way we can stop these people from growing. <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. We were really interfering with operations. We shut down two of their shareholders meetings. They had these big you know owners meetings. We shut them down." We were just an incredible thorn in their side. We weren't worth it. Uh, I mean, we, we made it not worth it for them to keep investing in mountaintop removal coal mining. And we stopped it. So I know the power of a campaign. It's enormous. If, if the person power that goes into protests in this country went into campaigns, we would be so much farther along than we are now. Um, and so that's one of the things that I hope is a result of uh, people reading this because they'll be able to, I don't actually, uh, you know, carry on in the book the way I'm carrying on right here. You've got my passion up, man. <laughs> but anyway, that's what I think. <laughs> okay. I think this will be maybe my last, and before I open it up, um, George and I have a running debate about whether it's a good time to be alive or not. And I started, we were hang out once i think george was george is old so i must have said something about how old george is and i think he he was in his earlier 80s um and I don't even know. <laughs> uh also george is gonna probably live forever your mom lasted to like what 102 or something yeah this is this is just the beginning um so Anyway, I said something like, I, I said something, I made a, a joke about George's age, and then George said, I'm so happy to still be here. This is the best time to be alive. And I said, you're fucking crazy. Because uh, that's, because it's clearly a very shitty time to be alive. And also you've been alive, you know, for really awesome periods of time. Uh, and 
we sort of went back and forth about this, and I would and um, I would love for you to tell us, tell the people here today why you think it's such a good time to be alive. That conclusion, which sounds so far fetched to you, I know. Um, came about as a result of my recognizing the biggest professional mistake I ever made in my life. My training is sociology. Spent untold numbers of years at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School learning sociology and and the University of Oslo. And one thing that sociologists get obsessed about if we're looking at any social system, whether it's as small as a family or whether it's as large as a nation, we're fascinated with the question, how cohesive is it? as compared with how conflicted is it, right? We're very interested in that question of cohesion and conflict. Okay, so a dozen years ago, I was, um, I was paying attention to the growing polarization in our country because I was noticing that a dozen years ago. And I was getting worried at the time. I was thinking, oh my gosh, how are we gonna make change if, um, if people can't even listen to each other, you know, who, who have differences? If people can't even dialogue with each other, then how can we reach conclusions that will enable us to move forward? And um, so I was really worrying about uh, polarization a dozen years ago. And at the same time, though, I was researching a book. This was two books ago. It was a book on Scandinavia. I was fascinated with why it was, that's the reason for the Norwegian sweater wherever, but uh, the, 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 uh, I was fascinated with how Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Iceland managed to create an economic system that with way less strong economies than ours initially, the time they did it, um, they were able to come up with an economic system that delivers far more equality than ours does, better schools, free universities, just you know, thing after thing after thing that we might think is pie in the sky. They've been enjoying that for decades and decades. Okay, so I was wanting to know not just how does their economic system work, I called it Viking Economics, the book. I wanted to know not only how it worked, I wanted to know how they got there because uh, a, a century ago, they were a mess. They were in terrible shape, which is why Norwegians were migrating to the United States and Swedes were coming to the United States. I'm, I'm told there's still a number of Norwegians holed up in Brooklyn. That's what I, I'm told. There, there are rumors to that effect. Um, and Seattle, every time I go to Seattle, I, I meet more Norwegians. It's just, uh, it, for, but descendants of, because actually the, some of the young ones are moving back <laughs> because things are so much better there than here, right? Okay, but 100 years ago, they were a mess. Okay, so I was curious. Uh, about how they made their leap forward because nobody else was writing about that. I found out they made their leap forward in the 20s and 30s in the period of greatest polarization that they had experienced in modern times. What? Didn't make sense. So I was scratching my head about that and thinking, I, I got to make sense out of this. I got to un understand. Okay, think of more cases, George, more cases. Well, I could think about the United States. How about the 1930s, which is the decade I was born in? What was going on? Tremendous polarization. Nazis able to finish, uh, you know, fill Madison Square Garden, right, in a rally. Um, Ku Klux Klan going wild, lynching people and so on. National right wing horrible stuff going on. And at the same time, the glory period of the American Communist Party, right, and other leftist groups flourishing, tremendous polarization in our country. And the 1930s was the greatest period of progress that we made in the first half of the 20th century. Go figure. So I'm even more stunned. I'm trying to figure it out. So then I leap forward to the 60s, which some of you will remember, the 60s, again, tremendous polarization, which is one reason I, I have these knife stories and stuff in here. I mean, it was dangerous on the street if you had a disagreement, right? The tremendous, uh, the Nazis came back in America. We, we had the Nazi party, you know, and the Ku Klux Klan bombing churches, the, the whole deal going on on the right. And on the left, some of the craziest stuff that I have ever known about uh, in the, uh, on the left is going on, as well as some very strong movements on the left. Um, 
and uh, and they, but a tremendous polarization. Not only that, parents pulling their hair out because their kids were going to Sweden instead of going into the army because of Vietnam, fighting, fighting, fighting over Thanksgiving dinner, and so on. Okay, all that was going on in the 60s. And the 60s, which sloped over into the 70s, was the greatest period of progress that we made in the second half of the 20th century. Polarization and progress. It keeps showing up. So I'm, I'm in wonderment. I'm, I frankly, I just feel professionally at sea. On the other hand, I have a book to, to sell. So I'm doing book tour through for Viking economics. I'm doing that book then. So I'm r- running around Britain. The Brits are nuts about the Scandinavians. So I run all over the Brit- Britain having meetings like this, and they're all enthralled about what's going on across the North Sea. And um, I happen to be staying with a Quaker in um, in t- some town, I forget which town it was, who was a sculptor and had a long career as a sculptor, but lately had been starting to work on metal, using metal as his medium. And I was wandering around th- this big house, Victor- old Victorian house, full of gorgeous metal sculpture. And I was just in ooing and eyeing, you know, about how gorgeous it was. I said, how can you do that, though, with metal? Metal is stiff. It just does, you know, it doesn't want to do what you want it to do, right? And he said, let me show you. Come on, George. So we go out through his kitchen into the backyard. There's his big studio. We go into the studio, and he shows me his forge. And he says, yeah, I had to apprentice with a blacksmith to find out how to use this thing. And because you're right, metal doesn't want to do what I want it to do. So I have to heat it up. And when it's heated up, it's malleable. And then I can work it. Thank you, I said. (laughs) You've resolved this huge conflict I've had in my head. You've given me a, a, a metaphor that I can work with. Polarization is a forge that heats up society. It melts norms, right? It makes institutions malleable. It opens the way so that we can make the biggest progress in the first half of the 20th century in the 30s, so we can do it again in the 60s and 70s, because polarization was there in both places doing its thing. And just like a forge, Polarization couldn't care less what you do with it. Does a forge care if a blacksmith makes horseshoes or a metal sculptor makes metals? Or if I had it to do with a forge, I would make junk. Forge wouldn't care. It just does its thing. Well, same with polarization. At the same time as the Scandinavians were leaping ahead, the Germans were doing Hitler. Right? They were building a Nazi movement. They had tremendous polarization. And they were building a Nazi party and, and putting Hitler in. And, and in Italy, at the very same time, tremendous polarization, huge communist movement, huge fascist movement, and fascism won, and they had Mussolini. Forge doesn't care. Mussolini, Hitler, you know, wonderful Scandinavian social democracy. Couldn't care less. We'll just heat the society. You do what you want with it. Whoa. So, yes, yo, Tom, I am so glad I'm here with you. Clearly. I am so glad I'm not dead with this, with this perception. As far as I know, I'm the only one in the country who talks about a forge. <laughs> Outside the context of, you know, uh, metal sculpture or something. It's a forge, folks. It's our chance. And as, as you know from the article we wrote together, because this polarization looks like it's going to be bigger than the 30s. How exciting is that? And bigger than the 60s. How exciting is that? Talk about malleable institutions. Talk about melting norms that keep people imprisoned in the old ways, oh my God, this is liberation land. But of course, if we don't have mass movements that know that, 
uh, then we'll just get our, you know, we'll get fascism. Let's, probably some very boring kind. <laughs> so what a choice we've got. We're, we're the blacksmiths here. We're, we're, the, we're the metal sculptors here. We get to do this. So I am, so I want to be with you. And the younger you are, the more I want to be with you. <laughs> because that helps keep me alive so I can stay awake longer and be with you. Thanks. Okay. I think we'll open it up. Um, so if you've got, thanks, George. Um, if you've got questions, raise your hand and I'll, da, 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 and then you'll get a mic and um, this bunch of you. So, you know, try to keep it, try to really think about what you actually want George to talk about. Hmm. Um, yeah. Any questions? Let's actually stop for a second. Why don't you just turn to the person next to you. If you are like, I fucking hate shit like that. You don't have to do it. Just like pull out your phone and pretend you're, you're very busy. But otherwise, um, just turn to the person next to you and just, just say one thing that you, f that you are like struck by or moved by in what George talked about. I'll give you like a minute for that. And then I'll ask you again if you have questions. Something you're struck by or moved by. comes up, if we'll give you the opportunity to, to say it. Mm -hmm. It's more painful. Yeah, but it's not just not, not only is it more intense, it but also scary. more painful. Yeah. yeah, because there's a lot of pain. I didn't think it was that at all. It's okay, you did. Yeah. That was the first draft. I would have said, well, right. I don't believe that we're done. You would say, right. but right. I didn't want to take the time. Yeah. Okay, folks. Okay, so any questions? Or challenges? Yeah. No, no, I can't challenge, <laughs> no way. Um, Yo Tom is an example of people that thankfully you've mentored and influenced. Uh, I'd like to know who do you look back on as influencing your life and helping you become the person you've become? Oh, wow. Very big influence on me was A.J. Musty and Bayard Rustin. Um, A.J. Uh, mentored Bayard, but then Bayard became his own amazing self. And whenever either of those, I was still, I was in Philadelphia. Whenever any of them would, either of them would come to Philadelphia, I was there, right? And then uh, I started getting on committees and stuff that met in New York so I could be on committees with them. And then uh, we created together uh, the, those two, A.J. Musty and Bayard Rustin, and uh, a bunch of other people, including me, created something called the Martin Luther King School of Social Change, which used to give actually a, a master's degree in social change. I called it an MA, Master's in Agitation. Um, and uh, so we, we used to give a graduate degree and they, and, but the gang that got together around AJ and Bayard, um, were creating the curriculum and I was there because I was going to be a teacher and, uh, for, of the curriculum. So I needed to be there. Can you do just like a one sentence? Sorry. Um, can you just say a sentence about who each of those were in case oh, people yeah, don't know? Yeah. AJ talk about experience. His, his uh, he came out of the first world war. He started his activism in, during World War I. He was thrown out of his job as a minister in a church because he was a pacifist. And then in the 20s, uh, he, he tried out Trotskyism. So he, he, he just had uh, a very strong left uh, career, 
uh, came back to pacifism, but with a very revolutionary um, dimension and created the idea of a nonviolent revolution, which is my politics. Uh, so I was hugely influenced by AJ. Um, and he was still around in his 80s. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, <laughs> when, you know, when I was a young, young sprout and I was uh, following him around and I was following Bayard around a lot. And um, I, I talk about both of them in the book. They, Bayard was so dynamic. Um, I, I do. I mean, he. I, I, did any of you cross paths with Bayard? He's been gone now for a while. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he was a mentor to Dr. King. He was, he, yeah, yeah, he was um, amazing. So he, he wasn't my mentor. I couldn't get close enough to him um, but because he was surrounded all the time. But I, I would be, you know, in that, I would, be, I would be, try to get to be one of those surrounding him. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Questions? Thoughts, challenges, things you want George to talk about? How, how much does Quakerism, what role does it play? I mean, has it increased? Does it stay with you? Are you do you still uh, worship? Um, how, how much and how much do you call on that over the years to, um, you know, center you or keep you together? Uh, how do a, you call on it? Yeah, yeah. Were you able to hear it over there? The, the the Quaker connection. I wandered into a Quaker meeting when I was in college, wondering what on earth it was, and then really got to like it, and uh, then became a member, and I'm still a member, an active member. Um, yeah, it's uh, part of what influences me about Quakerism is um, that at least the kind of Quakerism that the the branch of it that I'm part of doesn't require a Christian uh theology or any particular theology but because i'm uh, there, there's a, a dimension of christianity that's still very important to me i was brought up that way uh, i can retain it but still be with lots of other people and there's a kind of intellectual uh, curiosity and openness there that i very much appreciate and another thing i appreciate about quakerism a lot is a very friendly to innovation figuring we don't know it all you know, and and we need to try this, try that, try this, try that, uh, and and a, a great um, a kind of training to be open to spirit as one source of innovation. So it's not only a kind of uh, you know personal creativity, but it's also a kind of thing that can like uh, stream into us and uh, and evoke a new thought or a new possibility at first might sound just crazy. Um, for example, Quakers came to Pennsylvania without guns, intending to make friends with the native people. Everybody coming from Europe brought guns, right? I mean, it was going to be a settler, just a traditional settler, horrible, you know, imperial deal, right? Uh, Quakers said, no, 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 there's something, wrong, there's something wrong about that. We don't carry guns at home. We're not going to do it there either. We're not going to kill anybody. We're not going to Pennsylvania to kill. In fact, we just don't do that. Um, so, and they were the, they turned out, they were the safest people on the American frontier. The people without the guns were the safest people. So do, doing stuff like that, you know, that spirit impels us to do, and then finding out empirical reality lines up with that, well, that's got to be very satisfying to a sociologist because sociologists can be very slow in researching stuff. We can take a while to figure stuff out. And, uh, and if there's a quicker route, Quaker, quicker, uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I saw Miles in the front here and Lissy after that. Hi, George. It's been really lovely hearing um, stories. And I, I want to hear a story about uh, the, the end of the civil rights movement, or at least the end of your participation in the civil rights movement. Um, and in particular, I think there's a, a received history around uh, a sort of like factionalism or the movement devolving into factionalism from, from civil rights to black power, from sort of more integrated uh, movements to something more uh, 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 to something more concentrated on like building community for uh, 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 like the, the people. And I wonder 
I want to hear your experience in that as a as a white person in the movement during that time. Right. Well, uh, what the problem for the civil rights movement that led to its demise was that it kept getting more radical because it kept learning from its own experience and coming more and more to the conclusion that it was operating within an, an empire system. And uh, that, <laughs> and one social movement can't take on an empire status, uh, w w and win. <laughs> so that was a basic contradiction. Uh, so Bayard's way of handling that was to say, okay, so it needs to go into coalition with white workers. So we'll get black people and white workers together because they have common goals, blah, blah, blah. But he was never able to pull that coalition fully together um, for various reasons, including especially racism on the part of the white workers. But also because the working class had already made its peace with the empire. It was doing better at the time than working classes were in a lot of other places, right? So. Uh, so I thought, well, we've got the best deal we're likely to get and so on. Whereas black people hadn't gotten the best deal that was available because it was possible to envision something, you know, uh, e equality. It was possible to, and, and still is possible to envision that. But to get that, we need a huge mass movement. So, so I felt like intellectually, uh, with my sociological training and so on, and my interest in ideology and so on, I should be developing a theory of mass movement development that would aim to do in the empire. <laughs> and so that was one of my first books. It was a strategy for a living revolution. And that, and I, I just really prized that word, but getting, um, Oh, so part of, part of our fun, uh, as, as co-writers of that waging on violence, uh, article was, uh, that to, Try to, to it was that I I was taking a leap and saying more polarization that means more pain I I don't want to discount the pain that goes with polarization I, my family can tell you they will find me crying over the morning newspaper sometimes at breakfast I'm very very touched in my heart by all the pain that goes with polarization so I don't want to just because I'm optimistic about what can go with it doesn't mean that I like it. Okay. Okay. But the forge isn't asking my permission. <laughs> it's just heating, heating, heating. In my view, we're going to have more and more polarization. That means more and more chance for an actual revolution. We've never had objectively in our system, at least in my lifetime, a real chance for revolution, even though people have chanted the word a lot, it's not been available objectively. Right. I think, especially because of climate and the amount of delegitimization that the, imp the impossibility of our government to deal with climate is going to result in, uh, will provide a revolutionary opportunity. And so what, so the, I think the civil rights movement was too early in the sense that it couldn't get the allies that it needed to continue to follow the vision of its more revolutionary, the more revolutionary uh, leaders within it. Um, so it, 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 it settled, you know, it settled. And that's what movements do. I ran into, in, in Maine, I was doing a, a statewide uh, climate conference, climate uh, justice conference. And so all these great climate activists were in the room, huge room, and uh, it included a couple of politicians and I noticed, oh, yes, it's running for office time, right? So I thought, well, I better warn people. So I said, oh, by the way, I just want you to know uh, there are some politicians among you. They'll be making friends with you and schmoozing now at a coffee hour in a minute. And, uh, the, and the Democrats among them uh, will try to co-opt your movement. And this is early in the development of Maine's climate movement. And I just want you to know that's what they'll be doing because the Democratic Party's job is to co-opt social movements and bring them safely into the fold so they'll work for Democrats instead of working for a revolution. And so uh, that's, that's what's going to happen in the coffee hour in a minute. So, okay, so, uh, so then the, the, uh, 
the the ho- the moderator was relieved to tell me it was time to go <laughs> and allow the coffee to happen. Goodbye, George. Okay, okay, okay. So so I was folding my papers together and uh, over comes one of the guys who was running for governor right out of central casting in Hollywood. You know, this handsome, just like right out, you know, right out of central casting. And he strides over with his big, warm smile, you know, and he comes right up to me and he says, oh, an excellent speech. Thank you. Uh, thank you, I said. And he said, uh, you know, you're right about that. And I said, oh, what? What am I right about that? He said, you're right about that. That is what we do. We Democrats, we co-opt social movements. And uh, I just thought uh, you, you ought to, you know, you, you, you deserve to uh, get that support because you're right. We do that. And he said, we're really good at it. And then he walked off. <laughs> So, so how can you expect a, a movement, right, like the civil rights movement or any of our movements um, that feels overwhelmed, that, whose, whose vision expands because action gets to expand our vision? I know action can wear people down, but if, they're, if I'm in their group, it expands their vision. And, uh, and, and then as a, vi- a vision grows, you want more, right? but then that collides with the objective situation, and we haven't had it. But my contention is we will have a striking chance at it because of the climate uh, catastrophes that are upon it. And that means more pain, more George crying at the breakfast table, and more opportunity for George to come to New York and talk with you all. Thanks. Do you want to? Thank you so much, George. Um, This is sort of just continuing in the thread you've already been in, but I was curious if you see the legacy of A.J. Musty or Bayard Rustin, your own lineage expressed today in movements or organizations today, or whether you feel like we're kind of moving in different waters now, or there's a different tradition of the left that's expressing itself in these conditions. I don't see it. I feel kind of lonely. Well, there you have it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> you wish what? I, oh, I'm with you in the loneliness around that. What, what is missing? Oh, the organizer in me <laughs> is all excited. To, no, uh, let's talk. <laughs> and what's that? What's missing? What's missing? That what what I'm calling for shorthand. I'm sure there's a better phrase we can use, but nonviolent revolution, a, a nonviolent revolution politics, right? That has to do with mass movements and has to do with coalition building and has to do with, um, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, there's been such advance in consciousness, right? In the in the last 30, 40 years, and it's so. Consciousness about uh, interlocking oppressions and so on is just like we're we're in way better shape than we were, but uh, but also lacking a politics that can make uh, increase the impact of that. It it can fall back into moralization and just more moralizing, moralizing, moralizing. I'm I'm more politically correct than you, right? And that's. That's so destructive. We have that in Philadelphia. I'm sure you don't have that in New York, but we, we do we do have that problem in Philadelphia. So um, yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I agree. I've, I've I've done my best, but we need to talk more. Hi. Yes. Um, do you think that social media siphons off the community organi- uh, organizing potential, or do you think it adds to the potential? Social media. Does social media siphon away community organizing potential from people, or does it add to community, like the actual organizing potential of people? I steer stay away from social media because I don't trust it at all. It looks to me like it 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 has um, an inherent uh, ability to amp up uh, silliness and. Uh, <laughs> needless critique and self-inflating whatever uh in in ways that aren't really supportive to the the dialogue that we need yeah so i i i try to avoid it at all costs (laughs) 
Uh, hi, thank you. Um, this is kind of a combination of the things me and Tomia were both interested that you talked about. Uh, one part was um, I have curiosity around your training experience as a trainer and if you have like a training philosophy. And Tomia mentioned the, being curious about um, the courage training you mentioned. And so it's partly a question about asking you to talk more about that in your process, but also second part is um, were there experiences where you like grew that courage muscle for yourself um, that you could advise people on? I was so blessed to have a lover who understood when I was, when he watched me burning out that I needed a sabbatical. And so he said, take a year and a half off. I will raise the money to for, uh, make that possible. Because I've always lived very close to the market and uh, didn't have that, you know, didn't have that money in the bank. So he said, I will find the money, take a year and a half off, do whatever you want. So at first I loafed. That was fantastic. And then I got to thinking, look, George, you've always loved teaching slash training. I mean, I've taught at universities. And I've also, uh, but but most most of what I love to do is with activists, right? So um, why don't you take a new look at the most progressive forms of pedagogy? Uh, we've we've done popular ed. Thank you, Paulo Freire. Thank you, thank you. And you're on top of that, and you think that's insufficient. So George, find. Find out what else is going on. So and, and and be innovative yourself. So I spent most of the year just doing that, playing around, playing around with all kinds of stuff. Thank goodness there were people willing to play, and <laughs> and came up with uh, what I think was is a new form of education or training called direct education. And um, I wrote a book about it uh, after trying it out in multiple cultures. I've I've led over fifteen workshops on. Five continents, actually. We spent a tremendous lot of time. Ten years in Thailand, back and forth. Ten years in Russia, back and forth. Worked in Africa. The African National Congress had me come over and do training. So all the all these different places. So I could take the, the uh, you know, I kept innovating and finding out other people innovating uh, various tactics, various methods for teaching. Um, but I wanted the ones that would be, that would travel well across cultural lines. And so I would try different ones, you know, and some traveled well and some didn't. Okay, drop or, you know, okay, pay attention to that. And so out of all that came a whole batch of, uh, of theory and practice that I called direct education. And we started an outfit called Training for Change out of that. And, and I've been in touch with brilliant people like Yotam who have just, like, you know, brought their own innovative approach. And um, it's it's been a wonderful uh, wonderful journey, so it is one of the things I'm most excited about. And I do tell some about some training stories in here, um, but I told a bunch of yummy training stories in my earlier book, facilitating group learning. So uh, you 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 will especially enjoy that one, I think. I think we're about at time. Is that is that right? If there's any any. I can take a last one or yeah. courage. I think there's a question for you about how. Well, do you want to say it? Again? I mean, what I got got from it was what were the ways that you uh, managed to cultivate your own courage, and what advice do you have for people today on how they might do that? Yes. And that might be a good note to end on. I learned something so profound from a Quaker lion tamer. <laughs> a Quaker lion tamer who I met in Holland. I was doing book tour in Holland. And this guy picks me up at the railroad station, says, I'm, I'm the local person you know, who's to take you to your workshop tomorrow. And uh, you'll stay overnight at my house. So, okay, so I get in his car. So he's driving along and he says, actually, uh, the way I make my living now is I run a little museum, but most of my life I've been a career uh, worker in circuses. I work with 
cats especially. I love big cats. Lions, tigers, love them. I work with bears sometimes, but mostly lions and tigers. And I said, whoa, I've never met a lion tamer before. Uh, if you, you know, tell me more, tell me more. So when we get to his house, he shows me a scrapbook. So I'm, open, I'm page after page of this man, you know, with, with it's, it's like they're pussy cats to him, right? And, and then there's the classical picture. You've all seen a picture of a guy with his head in the mouth of, right, a big lion, right? And so I come to that picture. And I look at him and I say, man, you are the bravest person I have ever met. And he said, I wish that were the case. My problem is that I'm not scared of them. He said, they've always seemed to me like pussycats. And as a boy, I loved to play with pussycats. And they're just big pussycats to me. So he said, most lion tamers are really terrified, and I admire them um, for doing what they do because they're very courageous people, but I can't get to be brave that way. So I have to find other ways to be brave because it's a part of my wish as a human being to be a brave person. So I have to find other things that scare me and do those things in order to be brave. Whoa, said I. Thank you. Because I'd been there intuitively, but not so clearly as that. So we can all be much braver than we are, I believe that, and with increasing polarization, we'll all need to be <laughs> braver than we are. And so the sooner the better, do the stuff that scares you. Uh, for 99% of the people I've worked with in workshops, standing on a box and speaking to people as they walk by in the street is plenty terrifying enough. <laughs> But I'm sure that, uh, you know, if we put our heads together, we could think of other terrifying things for people to do. Um, but that's the, that's the practice. And so the, I just try to do, uh, what's an 85-year-old doing running around 20 states in Canada with a book? I mean, what makes me think I can even do that? So this is one of the ways that I can keep, you know, keep my courage up is to do something that anybody sensible wouldn't do. Uh, except that I, I think it is sensible to be brave, and I want to be brave when I grow up. <laughs> I really recommend that you read this book. It's full of really amazing stories and, you, and moving stories. And most of the stories you heard now were from the second volume that was cut, so you're not even getting repeats. And George, it's an honor. Thanks. Thank you.